Good morning again. What a great morning it's already been. And I, I want to add my thanks to our Next Gen team, uh, Taylor Shade, our Next Gen director, about to be Next Gen pastor. He's just finished seminary, is getting ready to be ordained. And for Katie, uh, our student ministry associate, and for Ben, our, our kids director, y'all, we have a phenomenal Next Gen team. So can y'all give them a shout out? Uh, last week is due to their incredible leadership. And one of the great things that good leaders do is they have a lot of people to work with them. And, and there was a host of volunteers, many of you in the room. So thank you for uh, investing in our students and our kids. God, I mean, we want kids to have wow experiences. So they will always know the gospel. They will know the good news of Jesus. They will never have a day where they know there's not a church that loves them and is walking with them. And there are people invested in their lives. So I love VBS for that reason. So one more shout out. It was an awesome week. So summer stories. I mean, stories are such an important part of our life. And dads, you have a lot of stories and you tell a lot of stories. And uh, man, I, I tell you, I'll always remember the way Mark told our young kids stories. About when they were this age, if you had come to our house, you would have known Ubi and Knuckles, who Mark used very effectively to tell stories to the kids. And you would also know the Sheriff of Letterville. Mark did a mean story to these kids. He was so good at it. And the kids always knew that God loved them. They always knew that Mark loved them. What, what a powerful impact you dads can have on your kids. Of course, it's my second Father's Day with my uh, dad in heaven, and I'll never forget how my dad told stories. You know, his last year of life, uh, we would do a lot of sitting with dad, and my brother and my sisters would ask him to tell stories, uh, because we wanted those, we wanted to hear him say them again. And we took videos of those stories, and there I am laying with dad, and, and that day he was telling me stories of, again about how he fell in love with mom. And he was telling me stories about their honeymoon when they went to New York City and my mom won The Price is Right, including patio furniture that is at my house. <laughs> Dad told stories about uh, the day I was born and what it was like to be going to the hospital and, and getting ready for me to be born. And Dad uh, told me stories uh, very fondly with a, a kind of a, gl a glimmer in his eye. He said, I loved talking to you every day you preach and saying, please don't embarrass me. That's what Dad would always say to me. He loved telling that story. And of course, what I knew is Dad wasn't embarrassed. He was proud of me. I knew that dad loved me, and dad was always wanting to point me to Jesus. Man, pow stories are so powerful. You know, uh, they're an important part of our experience. But stories don't just give us a, a shared experience. Stories really change us. I read a, a an article this week in the Wall Street Journal, and it was written by uh, Allison Gottmik. And she told about the collaboration that a group of literary scholars and a group of neuroscientists were, were doing. They were studying the brain. So they looked at dozens and hundreds of, of brain scans and they found that stories definitely shape our thoughts, obviously. But even more important, they, stories foster this connection between the storyteller and the listener. And what the scan showed is that your brain literally changed as you heard stories with people who you were close to. And the closer the connection between the storyteller and the listener, the greater understanding of that story and the greater intimacy happened. Powerful. Now with a tip of, uh, to Dr. Spock, the article ends this way. It says this. The results suggest that we lowly humans are actually as good at mind melding as Star Trek's Vulcans or the Borg. We just do it with stories. What they're saying is that stories connect us. This summer, all summer, we are going to be listening to stories that Jesus told. Now, why would we choose that? Well, very simply, we want you to know 
the storyteller. We want to know Jesus, and as we hear his stories about his kingdom and stories about how we live the Jesus life, we get more connected to him. We want our minds to be melded to him. We want the mind of Christ. Paul said it this way. He said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As we hear these stories, we want our mind to be changed. We want to know the mind of Christ. The stories that Jesus told, of course, are called parables. The word parable comes from the Greek word parabole, which literally means throwing alongside. So Jesus took everyday things and threw them alongside a new way of life. Jesus took ordinary things and he compared them to kingdom living, following Jesus. So Jesus told parables using ordinary to point us to something extraordinary. Don't forgive that. We're going to come back to this idea all throughout the series. Now, when you read the Gospels, first four books of the New Testament, if you know them, name them with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of course, those are the first four books of the New Testament, and all of them chronicle the life of Jesus. They're called Gospels because Gospel means good news. So they tell the good news of the life of Jesus. If you read all the way from Matthew to the end of John, you would find, this is crazy, you'd find 39 parables that Jesus told. And in the Gospel of Luke, you would find 24 of those parables. So today we're starting in Luke. And we're starting with the parable of the soils. Sometimes people call it the parable of the sower. It's interesting. This parable is found in three of the four Gospels. They're called synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. And it's because those three Gospels really tell the story in the same way. One eye is what synoptic means. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the, gospel, tell the gospel story very similarly, but John's very different. This parable of the soils shows up in every one of the synoptic gospels. Now, I want you to listen to this parable, but listen for the different kinds of soils. We're going to come back to those. The different kinds of soils. Here's what Jesus said. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, Jesus told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When Jesus said this, he called out, He who has ears, let him hear. Pretty simple simple story, isn't it? The farmer sows the seed on the soils. All the soils get the seed. That was the way farmers planted They would scatter the seed broadly because the soil, uh, before the soil was plowed, so naturally the seed went everywhere. It didn't always go to the right place. And what Jesus is telling us is that depending on where the seed landed, the results were different. The seed landed on the path. Now, in the fields in those days, there were strips of the path between the crops. And when you read in the, in the Gospels, you will see Jesus and the disciples regularly walked through these paths in the crops. But the path is hard. The seed gets trampled by people and animals. 
So there's no soft soil to help the seed take root. There's no soil where the seed can grow. So the seed becomes food for the birds rather than fruit. Some of the seed lands on rock. When Jesus tells this story uh, where he is geographically, everyone would have understood that because there is massive amounts of limestone that runs through that region. So it would have made perfect sense to the hearers that there are places where there's rock with a little bit of soil on top. Not near enough soil, not deep enough for there to be any kind of growth. See, here's what happens. When the the sun comes up, it heats the limestone. It gets hot. So the seed doesn't have a chance. The sun is coming from, the sun is putting a a heat on the, the seed, and then the limestone is heating it up. You see, there's just no way there's enough moisture. There's no way roots can grow on the rock. Some seed falls on soil where there are thorns and weeds. Anybody else having a a good fight with weeds this summer already? Right, me? Yeah, we're terrible at that. Well, what happens to the thorns and the weeds is that while the seed is growing, so are the thorns and so are the weeds. So it germinates, the little seed does, and it starts growing and it begins to bear fruit, but then the The weeds take over, and the thorns take over, and they literally choke the growth out of the plant. But the seed, Jesus said, also falls on good soil. And the good soil has every opportunity to bear fruit. It's rich, and it's fertilized, and it has water, and it has place for roots to grow deep. And Jesus says when that happens... The soil bears fruit over and over and over again, a hundredfold. This is a parable. It's a very ordinary story. All the hearers can relate to this story. Even if they weren't farmers, they would have seen fields all around them. But there's got to be more to it. If Jesus is telling this story, there's got to be more to it. Now, I suspect there's been a time in your life where you've been with a a circle of friends, (laughs) and someone tells a joke, and everyone gets it except you. And you're kind of embarrassed. I mean, you feel like an outsider, so you just kind of laugh along. Have you done that before? Well, that had to be what... The disciples were feeling they they wouldn't dare ask because they knew as they heard the story that they were supposed to understand what Jesus was saying. They knew there was more. They knew that Jesus had something in mind that was more than a 100 level lecture to Jerusalem State Ag students. Okay, thanks for that last. I appreciate that. So later on, when the crowd disappears... And it's just Jesus and the disciples, they finally get around to asking, hey, Jesus, you know that story you told? We don't get it. And they ask, and Jesus is so good, he answers. This is what he said. He said, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures and they do not mature, but the seed on good soil, it stands for those with a a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. 
so good that Jesus gave them cliff notes or spark notes. And only the ones close to Jesus get to hear this explanation. It was such an ordinary story. But it points to something extraordinary. Jesus says the seed is the word of God. And the soils represent all kinds of people and how they respond to God's word. Jesus says this is a story not about soils. This is a story about people. See, Jesus spent his whole ministry throwing out seed. He throws out seed and he invites people to live in the kingdom of God. All kinds of people, including fishermen and tax collectors and religious people and people who weren't religious at all. Rich young ruler, people who've been healed by diseases, centurions, women, nameless, countless people Jesus threw out the seed. You know, many people expected that the kingdom of God was going to come so different than it came. They thought there was going to be this this big bang, this this pomp and circumstance with a, a new king and a lot of power. But Jesus says, no, the kingdom is more like a farmer who throws out and scatters seed. There are people who will hear Jesus in person, in the synagogue, but they can't hear and they can't accept what Jesus is saying. There's a religious person who will come to Jesus at night, but it's too much for him to take. There are people who follow Jesus because they love the signs he can do. They love the miracles that he'll perform. But they don't want anything to do with the kind of life that those miracles and those signs are inviting them to. But then there are others. Tax collectors who hear and they follow and they change their life. Fishermen who hear the invitation and they drop their nets and they follow Jesus. Women who get their lives turned upside down and they follow Jesus and they support his ministry. They hear and they begin to grow and we know that the fruit is coming. And this is just the beginning of the kingdom that Jesus is bringing. The seed of the gospel of the kingdom keeps being thrown for generations, including in your life. See, it's not just enough to hear Jesus. No, you hear it and it goes to your heart. And it changes you. It's an invitation to live different. See, God's plan is for us to thrive, to be seed growing in this this good soil. And here's how Jesus describes the good soil. He says, the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and a good heart. People who hear the word and retain the word and by the persevering produce a crop. And my friend, when that happens, it is a work of God in your life. If you are to be a person in the good soil, what does that soil look like? Soil must be soft. 
I've already said this. You don't just hear the word. It, it goes deep into your heart. When the soil is soft, you, you are open to what God is going to do in your life. You are humble about what God is doing in your life. And you know that you need God to work in your life. Soil must also be deep. See, as the word comes to you, in deep soil, it germinates, and then it grows. But there's so much of what is happening that you don't get to see. It's, it's underground. And if there is no deep soil, it can't hold water. It can't hold the nutrients. So there's no way for you to have deep roots. If you're going to grow, your soil has to be deep. There's a cultivating of a, a deep life that has you opening up God's word. You know, you can, you can access that every minute of your life. Cultivating a deep life means being connected to God in prayer. Cultivating a deep life means being in community with other believers. Soil must also be constantly worked because those thorns and those weeds, man, they don't disappear. They don't ever go away. How many of you have weeds in your life? And I'm not talking about in your yard. See, God's work in our life, if we're going to have this deep soil, it cannot be quick. It is for a lifetime. And there are so many things that will compete in your life for the place of God. See, he wants to be your greatest affection. And to be deep soil, you have to keep making the decision over and over again to say yes to Jesus and to put him in that first place because the weeds are coming, the thorns are coming, and they want to get that out of your life. So you got to toil. you got to work the weeds if you want to bear fruit, if you want to be in the good soil. See, we don't let the world, good, bad, good stuff or bad stuff, choke out God's word and our commitment to following Jesus. Now, when I read that one, I feel like Jesus has been reading our newspapers over the last year. Did you notice what he said chokes out God's word in your life? First, he said worries. Anybody worrying out there lately? COVID, the stock market, war, violence, hate. Jesus said those worries can choke you, can stop you from growing, stop you from bearing fruit. But that's not the only thing that can choke you. You can get choked by riches, it says. You can get choked by pleasures, it says. Man, we think those are great. But now look out. They can choke your growth. If they take the place that only God is to take in your life. Some of you know the singer Rich Mullins. I love this line that he sings in one of his songs. He says, the stuff of earth competes for the allegiance that I owe only to the giver of all good things. So powerful. Stuff will always compete for the allegiance that only God should have in your life. See, God's dream for you, I mean, the whole reason Jesus tells this parable. Remember, it's ordinary pointing to extraordinary. God wants you to thrive. He wants you to grow. He wants you to allow the seed of the good news of Jesus to bear fruit in your life. 
And there are all kinds of seed that gets thrown at you. Maybe after the service, you'll share with the person next to you. What's some of the seed that God has used to grow in you? You know, my prayer is vacation Bible school was seed for these kids. That's the only reason we do it, so that they know Jesus. Maybe a camp that you're going, that you went to as a, as a, 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 as a 13-year-old, I went to a camp and God changed my life. Maybe you heard a sermon and man, you'll never forget it. God just reached into your heart and that was seed that grew you up. Maybe you went on a mission trip and you thought you were going to help other people, but instead it changed your life around. And God showed you something you had never seen before and you started growing. Maybe you've got a mentor in your life, someone who has lived right beside you and they're showing you what it means to follow Jesus. That's that seed in your life. Or maybe you're going through a really hard time and a believer, man, they stuck with you even though stuck with you and there are so many kinds of seed that get thrown to help you when you have a good soil grow Mark and I are miserable at keeping plants alive miserable absolutely miserable and what that can be flowers inside that can be grass outside it's it's equally we're bad I finally went to cactuses in our kitchen and The cactuses are still dying. I mean, this is not good. But our grass has been the worst. I mean, mean, over and over again, you look out and there's just, there's places where grass won't grow. And every year we keep at it. We overseed, we fertilize, we do all those things. One of the things we've used over the years is one of these. I mean, I, I just want to leave it in my basement and never use it again because it doesn't, it works for a while, but it doesn't work that great. You know what you do with this, right? You, you put the seed in the spreader and as you roll it across the yard, the seed goes everywhere. It goes on places where you need grass and places where you don't need grass. It goes on dirt, it goes on rocks, it grows on weeds. Your life can be one of these. Let me explain what I mean. See, God wants to use you in his seed-throwing project. That's why Jesus came. He was throwing seed so people would live a different kind of life. But now Jesus invites you to join in. To by your life throw seed so that people begin to see that the kingdom of God is real. That following Jesus is the only way to live the life that you were meant to live. See, you can be a seed sower, a seed spreader, and you do that when you show people the love of Jesus Christ. You do that when you care for each other as a community. You're throwing seed. People are watching. They're they're watching. You throw seed when you close the deal at work. (laughs) And you give God credit. You're throwing seed. It's awesome. You throw seed when you see injustice in the world and you do something about it. When you speak up for those who don't have a voice, you're throwing seed. You throw seed when you love your children well. You throw seed when you respect your parents well. You throw seed when you win or you lose the big game and you act like you know what's the most important thing in your life. There's more to that game, isn't there? You throw seed when you share with people, and I hope you do this, how Jesus has changed your life. See, you can be a part of this seed throwing that Jesus started. But don't forget what it said about where the seed goes. 
See, you will throw seed in your life, but sometimes it'll bear fruit and other times it won't. And those results are not up to you. That's above our pay grade. But you're not off the hook to throw it. See, God's plan for your life is that you are throwing the seeds so that other people will live the life that you live. I got to wrap up. But I want you to go home this afternoon and do something for me. Celebrate your dad's, yes. But also, go home and reread this parable in Luke 8. And let two questions kind of frame as you reread this. Here they are. First, what kind of soil are you living in? Is it rocky? Is it thorny? Is it weedy? Is it hard? Or is it good soil? And no matter how you answer, ask God to let your life be full of good soil so you will grow. You can ask him, and he will do it. And here's the second question. Are you a seed sower? You're going to leave this place, and all week you're going to be in a lot of places. And man, they need a lot of seed. They need the good news of Jesus. And that's what your life is supposed to look like. You are a seed sower. Two questions. What kind of soil are you living in? And are you a seed sower? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible book called the Bible that you gave us. Thank you for the Gospels, the way they chronicle the life of Jesus and the way they tell these stories that point us to the life that we're longing for. Even if we can't say that out loud, God, you made us to long for that life. We pray that you would give us ears to hear these stories this summer. We pray that they would connect us to Jesus and the Jesus way of life, this kingdom that you intend to come. And not later, but right now, through people who follow you. God, this afternoon, as people open up and reread this parable, by your spirit, would you convict and show and grow us up? God, we want to be good soil. We want to bear fruit. So we ask you to do that in our life. Finally, God, we pray that you would keep making Grace Church a community of seed sowers. God, we want that Jesus, who threw seed in our life, who's been at work in our life, and we want the whole Lehigh Valley to know it. So equip us, build us up, grow us up. Make us your seed sowers we pray Jesus that you would be glorified that you would be magnified in our life so that many more would know you we pray it in Jesus name